I'd like to thank the organizers for the uh, invitation to present. Um, it's a big topic for eight minutes, but here we go. End of leak in eight minutes. Um, <coughs> greetings from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Case Western Reserve University. Some interesting endoleak facts. So we know that endoleaks uh, can lead to aneurysm expansion. However, it has not been shown that endoleaks actually lead to rupture. Uh, now, an interesting paradox here is that most patients who rupture have had an endoleak. If you look at the data from the OVER trial, the uh, VA randomized trial comparing open versus endovascular repair, uh, they had follow-up uh, up to nine years. And I'd like to point out that all of these EVARs were implanted uh, per the IFU by the uh, individual manufacturer. They noticed a 30 percent uh, risk of endoleak. Uh, most of these were type 2 endoleak. Uh, the next most common was type 1 endoleak, and then a couple of uh, type 3s and some undefined. Now, they did find that endoleak was associated with, associated with aneurysm expansion, but they could not find an association with rupture. And this might just be a statistical uh, curiosity because most of the patients who have type 1 and type 3 endoleak, or even type 2 who are enlarging, do get repaired by the investigators. Uh, if you look at endoleak, uh, types, and I, I'm not really a fan of the term endoleak, uh, really what you're talking about is graft failure, but um, if you're talking about endoleak type 1, endoleaks are either a proximal type 1 uh, graft fixation failure or graft attachment failure, or type 1B is a distal attachment failure, and then um, type 2 obviously are, are uh, native branches that continue to supply arterialized pressure to the sac. Type 3 endoleaks uh, represent a graft failure, either a hole in the graft or a junction separation. And really, type 1 and type 3 uh, endoleaks need to be repaired. These are essentially like having uh, no repair at all in the aorta. They're, the uh, aneurysm is still subject to the full uh, arterial pressurization. Type 4 endoleak is uh, graft porosity, uh, not much of an issue nowadays. And type 5 endoleak, or endotension, really refers to aortic expansion in the absence of uh, visible endoleak on imaging. Uh, for diagnosis, typically we start with a contrast-enhanced <coughs> CT scan. Important to do a non-contrast scan, an arterial scan, and a delayed scan. Here on the left, you can see a type 1 endoleak on the arterial phase. Uh, the two images on the right show uh, no contrast in the arterial phase, but then on the delayed imaging, you can appreciate a type 2 endoleak. Uh, for a more definitive diagnosis, we can do arteriography with a catheter placed in the proximal aorta within the graft and from below. Uh, here is uh, an angiogram uh, showing a, a type 1 endoleak um, with, let's see here, you, you can see it, it's uh, blushing, but I'm trying to show you the top one here. There, there is a blush here, and with the, with the catheter now pulled down, this is not working right. Okay, this is the static images. So with the catheter placed high above the renal arteries, you can see that there is, there is a, an endoleak at the top. Then we can bring the catheter down into the graft to try to discriminate between a type 3 and a type 1 endoleak. And for further imaging, uh, another thing I like to do is to occlude the areas of interest with the balloon or inflate a couple of balloons. In the right panel here, uh, and this doesn't show up very well either, but you can keep uh, two balloons up in the iliac and then slowly inject contrast through this balloon and let it slowly just fill in here and wait for it to start leaking out. And uh, in this instance, we were able to find a, uh, a type 3 endoleak at the uh, junction here, which was uh, easily fixed. So treatment, type 1 and type 3, and growth with no endoleak, they all need to be treated or investigated and treated. Type 4 does not need to be treated. Uh, those go away after uh, the, the anticoagulation during the case resolves. And type 2 still is not known. And we'll go through these. So proximal attachment failure, type 1. Um, what are the options to treat this? Well, you can extend to the renal arteries if there's room with an aorta cuff. Or if that is not feasible, uh, given the uh, geometry, if there's not enough room for an aorta cuff, you can extend up with an aorto monoiliac system. And do a fem fem bypass. Uh, another option is you can extend above the level of the renal arteries and place a stent graft within the renal, causing like a, a chimney, or use some type of a fenestrated approach, uh, which would probably be a back table uh, thing that you manufacture on your own. 
You can try to secure the graft to the aortic wall uh, using the uh, aptus stapler, as we uh, talked about, or a palm oil stent. Or you can try to obliterate the channel, coils, glue, uh, et cetera. Um, just you have to be aware if you're going to obliterate the channel uh, that there's not going to be endotension. You may have a satisfactory angiographic result without decreasing the pressure in the sac. And uh, as, as a tip, I would say you need to consider what is your uh, surgical bailout. Um, already we know that it is difficult to convert these patients to open repair. If you place uh, half a dozen endostaples and then some uh, cyanoacrylate glue and some coils in that uh, neck and then put in a palma stent, that's going to make open repair very challenging. Uh, here's Ben Franklin, an ounce of prevention, right, is worth a pound of cure. Uh, I'm very heartened to hear everybody before me talk about staying within the IFU and not pushing the boundaries of the aortic neck. It is very unforgiving. Late open conversion is the number one uh, reason, I'm sorry, uh, type 1 endoleak, rather, is the number one reason for late uh, open conversion, and it's been found that uh, most of these patients did not follow the IFU. Mortality ranges from uh, 6 to 20 percent for open conversion, averaging around 10. A lot of morbidity, long stays in the hospital, uh, acute kidney injury, and the need for reoperation. So here's just some, some uh, images. Here's a type 1 endoleak <clears throat> causing a rupture, uh, repaired by extension uh, with a gore graft and a uh, renal chimney into the left renal artery protected with a balloon inflation. Here's a couple pictures of some palmaz stents securing the aortic neck, causing good fixation, good fixation in uh, challenging anatomy. Again, here's the stapler we were talking about, putting the, these uh, endo screws basically through the wall, securing the graft to the aorta. Some more pictures of the uh, helifix, either prophylactically in uh, challenging anatomy or as a rescue bailout. Here's a picture of coil embolization at the neck. These are not my own images, uh, where there was a, an endoleak here and some coils were placed to obliterate the uh, endoleak and the communication with the sac. Uh, distal attachment failures are usually more straightforward. Um, this is where the iliac landing zone is no longer sealing to the iliac artery. Um, really two situations here. One is there is enough common iliac artery to allow uh, extension of your stent graft into that healthy common iliac. That's rather straightforward. If there's not enough common iliac uh, to treat, then you need to bring that uh, stent graft down to the external iliac artery and then uh, somehow occlude the internal uh, with either a coil or you can try to preserve that with a, uh, um, a branch device if there's uh, room or using some type of snorkel. And if all this fails, if anatomically uh, this is not feasible, you can convert them to an aortal monoiliac system. Uh, just you know, an example of uh, one with a, a distal attachment leak extended out with a uh, stent graft. Uh, type 3, which is graft failure. Here's an image of a fabric rupture distally. These can either be junction failures if the uh, two pieces of the stent graft are not opposing correctly, you will get endoleak. And this can be fixed either with ballooning it or placing an intervening stent graft. And again, a fabric erosion problem, much less common nowadays with our modern stent grafts, more common in the uh, early 2000s. But uh, should you encounter one of these, it can be covered with another stent graft. This can be quite challenging if it's near the flow divider or above the flow divider where there may not be sufficient room to land an aortic cuff, and here your bailout would be an aortomonoiliac conversion. Just a picture of some graft failures, component separations repaired by um, placing an additional piece of stent graft material. Here's an endologics graft with a component separation repaired by an uh, interposition graft. And then endotension. This is where we see the sac increasing in size with no visible uh, endoleak on imaging. And I think it's important to remember that thrombus is another form of liquid. Pressure can be transmitted through thrombus, 
Uh, we know that thrombosed aneurysms can rupture. And lack of contrast in the sac does not guarantee that there will be a good seal or lack of pressure in the aortic sac. So to investigate, uh, use uh, contrast uh, CT scans and diagnostic angiography. I'd like to make sure that the uh, stent graft actually opposes the aortic wall. Sometimes you will see that there's, there's a gap, especially in the iliac arteries, where there may be laminar thrombus, so there is no endoleak going up, but you can see that there is the potential for uh, pressure to be transmitted through the thrombus in the iliac artery. Uh, diagnostic angiography is helpful, and uh, when in doubt, I like to put balloons up and then subject that graft to uh, contrast under time. And then um, what to do about type 2 endoleak. This is very controversial. Most type 2 endoleaks resolve without treatment. Um, the overtrial did show that delayed type 2 endoleaks may be more dangerous, meaning patients who did not have endoleak initially but then saw the development of type 2 endoleak late, those patients had more sac enlargement versus uh, patients who had early type 2 endoleak. Uh, rupture with type 2 endoleak uh, has been shown to occur without sac expansion. Uh, this being said, most recommend some treatment if there's growth. Uh, I'll be quick here. We're way over time. So um, the way to get at your type 2 endoleak is either transarterial, like through the superior mesenteric artery to the IMA, or the internal iliac through the lumbars, or direct sac access. You can place a catheter directly into the sac alongside the graft. You can have direct puncture, and some have even talked about transcable. Once there, coils and uh, glue such as onyx or cyanoacrylate are used to try to obliterate both the nidus and the uh, feeding vessels. All right, thank you. Uh, time for one quick question on endoleaks. Anyone? Over the long term, over the long term, do you think there's any role for statins in preventing late enlargement of the neck in EVAR? I can answer that. Statins. Statins. I guess there have been some suggestion of that, but I, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't feel terribly strongly about it in, in endoleak. I mean, definitely in, in uh, you know, calming the inflammatory response and, and aneurysms that haven't been treated. Dr. Backer? Yeah, so I'm not aware of that it impacts on the aneurysmal neck. Clearly, and there's some recent studies now with patients with PAD that clearly high-dose statins have shown an improved uh, mortality benefit. But um, I'm not aware that, the, that they're specifically a benefit um, in the setting of the aortic neck. Uh, and I, again, I suspect that dilatation of the aortic neck is multifactorial related to pressure and other phenomena that's not just due to the atherosclerotic process. So uh, I'm, but again, I'm not aware of any specific data.